I was wondering if you could tell us how long you were in North Korea when you were doing research for your book and how you were treated and what that was like, and then whether you ever see yourself going back there or whether you could go back there. Sure. Uh, there's Kinsella. Everyone give a hand to Stefan Kinsella. Yeah. <laughs> Rock star. Um, I was there for a week. Uh, I wrote a piece about it for Reason Magazine, Please Don't Hiss, um, which, which I'm very proud of. Uh, um, and that kind of launched my uh, TV career because that article was what got Kennedy, who at the time was co-host of a show called The Independence, with Matt Welch and Camille Foster, who is a good ANCAP and has the Mises slogan tattooed on his forearm, uh, got me on that show. Um, I was there for a week. I could go back. Don't ask me how. Uh, a friend of mine went after I did. He's from Czech Republic. And I looked at his photos, and that was like, you know what, once is enough. Because the reason, you know, sometimes I get sick of talking about North Korea, understandably, like Kinsella sick of talking about IP. But the thing is, and, and as, as maybe obnoxious this sounds, everyone I've met is still there. So this has been six years. And if you think about what you've done in your life for six years and realize that everyone, person I saw on the street, every grandmother, every kid, every teenager, they're all still there, trapped. In, and one of the things I didn't mention in my speech, which I bungled at the, t the timing of, you don't have internal migration in North Korea. You're not allowed to leave your city. And th the place you are assigned to live is based on your family's loyalty to the regime. So the people who are, it's called Sangban, the people who are disloyal to the regime or had an ancestor who was a property owner or a Christian or born in the South were shunted to the Northeast. And those were the last people who were sent food during the famine. So they use food as a mechanism of social control. So I mean, this is another layer of hell that these people are suffering under. Uh, I would not, so I wouldn't go back. How I did research for my book, well, all their books, uh, according to their mythology, everyone in the world's obsessed with the Juche idea, which doesn't make sense because it's only for Koreans, but apparently we all want to study it somehow. So all their books are translated into many languages. So I bought the entire library. Um, and I read all the Western books. I read 60 books total to fashion Dear Reader. And one of the jokes I have in my book, which is true, if you go in the bookstore, you would think, oh, they only have books about, by and about Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sung. That's not true. They have one book about Ri and Mo, who was the North Korean North Nelson Mandela, who was held as a prisoner in South Korea after the Korean War for many decades. Um, I have a question from Michael, too. Uh, your description of Korea reminded me a little bit of uh, Eastern Germany in the 80s. Uh, maybe same atmosphere, but much more exaggerated. So I was wondering, is there a possibility to escape from Northern Korea? Is the, are there people who try to, to get away? And then maybe I could expand on, the, on the, this theme, uh, rebellion, escape, uh, trying to go against stupid laws, against the governments, maybe is a resource to try to enhance uh, libertarianism. And maybe it's an instinctive reaction to the world we are living in, and maybe it's a, a, a glimmer of hope for, for the future, which seems pretty bleak, according to your uh, speeches it, it, of today. It is. So, it, uh, again, they have family punishment in North Korea, so if you escape successfully, your family's going to get punished for it. And in fact, anyone in North Korea who's a diplomat, uh, who's an ambassador, their family has to stay behind as hostages to make sure no one gets any uh, idea. So this is a level of control the North Koreans have. There's a very great book called Nothing to Envy by Barbara Demick, and she talks, tells this story. One of the things they do, they'll, get, they'll bribe an official to get a death certificate so the person died. Uh, a woman's family escaped, or her daughter or something, too. And often you won't tell your mom or your children, you know what I mean? So no one will get in trouble. Uh, woman is, uh, her, her daughter escapes, and now she has to escape. So she bribes the border guards with everything, and now she's in the Chinese countryside wandering around. And she comes across a farm, and on the floor there's a bowl of rice and meat on the floor. And she's stunned because she hadn't even seen meat in years. Uh, and now it's on the floor for some reason. And then she hears a dog barking. And that was her moment of realization that the people in China eat better, the dogs in China eat better than the people in North Korea. So, and, and what they started doing, the regime is brilliant in their evil. So it used to be you could bribe the border guard and you escape. Now the regime said, you can keep your bribe as long as you turn the people in. So you try to bribe the border guard, it goes in their pocket, but now you're turned in and, and, the, and your family's in trouble as well. So this is how they attempt to clamp down 
on, and, and I'll just add two more things very quickly. Uh, if you're caught in China as, uh, as North Korean and you're sent back, you're going to have very severe consequences. So many women are caught into sexual slavery because they know they can't call the authorities in China. Um, and when they do get to South Korea, and if every North Korean is automatically a South Korean citizen, they're treated tre very, very poorly. Their accent is described as guttural. They're, it's like they're hicks. Uh, they're shorter. They're low status. South Korea is a very competitive country. So it's a very dark uh, um, uh, uh, path for them, even in the best of circumstances. Uh, yeah, my name is Peter uh, from Hong Kong. Uh, I also have a question for Michael. Uh, can you tell us more about uh, the relationship between North Korea and China? Are they real th friends? Uh, well, uh, you know, people in the world might see the missiles uh, may be threatening uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, and the free world. But is it? Can it also be possible? Is a it poses a threat to Beijing, you know, because I, I really want to know the real relationship between these two countries. Because uh, I suspect they are not real friends, and yeah, they're, they're, yeah. they're, of course, they're so, not so really. please tell us more about that. Yeah, so uh, the Ottawa beer story, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, he was a tourist that went to North Korea. Uh, he stayed in the same hotel I did in the same floor because in the, the North Korean hotel it's segregated by nationality so our guards weren't allowed our guides excuse me weren't allowed on our floor and in fact their floor was jet black I don't even know maybe the windows are blocked out so they step all the el off the elevator into darkness it was it was very very weird um, when he di uh, died and there's actually some discrepancy about his death because his family said he came back tortured mutilated and the, the person who the medical examiner said that's not true. Um, when he died, this was a very hard thing for China to defend. Because if China is wanting to be a world leader and a rival power to the United States, it's, you can't defend a kid who you know, goes to a foreign country and comes back you know, as a vegetable. Um, and by the way, when you're staying there at that hotel, it's nicknamed the Alcatraz of Fun because it's on an island in the middle of the Taedong River in the middle of Pyongyang, and you're not allowed to leave it. Uh, so there is a very big misconception that China can end North Korea tomorrow if it wanted to. The idea that you can end a country with nuclear weapons overnight is, it, it, it makes no sense. Uh, there has been this huge tension, but at the same time, yeah, we can understand China doesn't want a U.S. ally right on their border. China doesn't want 25 million Koreans who have never used a computer, who don't speak Chinese, crossing the Tumen River and setting up camp in Manchuria. So China is in a tricky situation, uh, and North Korea isn't making it easier on them. And in fact, towards the end of his life, why Kim Jong-nam, the one who was killed, was passed over for Kim Jong-un, the youngest son of the three, uh, uh, he said, look, we could be like Beijing, we can liberalize. And Kim Jong-il said, according to the Jewish idea, that will work for Chinese people, it won't work for us. And if you want openness, open a window. Uh, so that's why he was passed over for Kim Jong-un, who promised to stay the course. Thank you. Uh, question for Stefan. Uh, very interesting overview. I'm sorry you kind of ran out of time, because um, uh, what I was really looking forward to was what we can take from international law as libertarians. And you kind of started on that with the anarchy the kind of similarity between anarchy and international law and how that functions. I'd love to hear a bit more about what we can take away from it. Yeah, and I think that was, <clears throat> that was one of the things that had me thinking about this topic in general, although it's just an interesting topic. But yeah, th so the fact that when, when people say anarchy is not possible, you say, hello, look at, the, look at the world. I mean, we have not only Kuzan's point that within governments there's a type of anarchy, right? Because the government personnel are not governed by a higher government. They, they constitute it. But the nations of the world are in a state of anarchy with each other as well. And it seems to work you know, fairly well. Uh, it's not always totally chaotic. So that's just one example of it. Uh, that, that's, you can use it as uh, an illustration of, uh, of, of how anarchy could be conceived to work. And then the treaties and the way law is formed, right, by custom and by agreements between these sovereigns, uh, it's, a, I think, a sort of a model for how we could envision uh, free people living together, too. Uh, just uh, follow up to that. The concept of sovereignty, which is at the foundation of international law, uh, any uh, takeaways we can take from that where, you know, in the, in the context of international law, it applies to countries, but we could equally uh, apply it to individuals. Yeah, and of course, the, yeah, so that's the idea, that we're in favor of radical decentralization and individual autonomy. Uh, instead of the nation state. But it's, it's just an example of a system that uh, I think can give some insights and 
it's, it's a fruitful field to explore. I think it can also highlight the, the deficiencies of the municipal law systems, right? So legislation based and uh, so welfare positivistic. I mean, if you think about the UN system, it's more like the Articles of Confederation in the US because they don't have really the power to tax the member states, depend upon voluntary contributions, which is more like the US was before the, the current constitution. And you know, most people think that was an improvement. We libertarians would think that was um, uh, re re retrogression. Hi, uh, I'm Frank, and I would like to ask Michael, um um, two questions. Uh, one would be, um, well, more or less serious. One would you consider will Germany put up on the list of? Uh, wait, wait. Is there Germany what? Uh, one would you? Uh, uh, what would you think if uh, the United States? Uh, why do you think the United States wouldn't put up Germany on the list of uh, terrorist supporting countries? Because, um, as you you mentioned, that Kim, the current leader in North Korea was um, minister of, or um, in propaganda and agitation actually uh, two of our leaders in germany now are secretaries of propaganda and agitation have been at least in east germany and this includes angela merkel so i was wondering well this is a very very um you know striking similarity and um, yeah that pointed out for me the importance of information and education and how even bad ideas ripple through continents and time oh, yes. so i was you know i immediately recalled when this this lady or someone asked about um could you escape like you could have escaped from east germany I, it, this came to my mind but now to a more serious question it's um you you talked about uh, nuclear and that north korea has the atomic bomb. How, how sure are you about this? Because um I, I am very sure, and here's how several reasons how we know. Besides, I don't think it's regarded largely in dispute. The question is how far those missiles can strike. But Kim, this there's a book that Kim Jong Nam, the the eldest son, wrote. Uh, it was a series of interviews he did with a Japanese journalist. I'm probably the only person in the West who's read it, and he talked about he wanted to denuclearize North Korea, and this was a big source of contention between him and his father, and another reason why he ended up being passed over. Uh, and as, as you know, he, he was recently killed. So uh, I think if he's even saying this, I don't think it's really any question. Now, the question is the size, of the capability, you know, all these other things, but uh, I, I don't think there's really any dispute of their nuclear capability. And I also think very importantly, two more points, there's no dispute that they would strike if they needed to. And even if they didn't have nukes, Seoul is just south of the border. It's a city of skyscrapers. So if you're not hitting them with nuclear missiles, but with regular missiles, the visuals alone is something out of a horror movie or like Independence Day or something. So that's something you absolutely have to take seriously. Jeff, thank you for your speech. And I appreciated your relatively empathetic tone towards zeitgeist libertarians and that we have to understand where they're coming from and the environment that they're operating in. But I like you to expand perhaps on a comment that you made at the end of another presentation that I heard you recently give where you indicated that it's time to give up the remnant mentality for those of us that are seeking truth and the implications thereof no matter what so perhaps you could expand on a engagement as strategy yeah it, very very tough uh, you can go back and find a um, I want to say maybe 1998 uh, talk that Hans Hoppe gave at a Mises event in California called uh, What Must Be Done. And I can send you that link or whatever. So I, I think he gives a few prongs there. And, and it's, it's the eternal question. It's always very, very tough. Everyone's got their opinion. But my own opinion is that uh, libertarianism as we know it is, is dead. Um, we shouldn't kid ourselves that Trump and, and other things have come into the room and sucked a lot of the oxygen up. Uh, versus 2012. Um, we shouldn't kid ourselves that a few million people online can feel like something much bigger uh, than it really is. When you see a Ron Paul go into, let's say, New Hampshire and get two or three percent of Republican primary voters in New Hampshire, not, you know, some sort of generalized electorate. Um, so, you know, I, I, I believe in never confusing motion with action and um, I think libertarianism is, is 
in bad shape as a political movement, and, and thus it's time for a realignment towards issue coalitions, uh, and, and more importantly, really pushing breakaway movements. And a lot of people don't like that because that smacks of some sort of nationalism, but I'll take sub-nationalism over, over uh, the nationalism we've got now. So um, I, I think th the idea that we're gonna convince 70 million people in America to vote for some national candidate is, a, is so daunting that it, it, it's wearying and that we ought to be thinking more in guerrilla terms, you know, go, uh, the, uh, go, you know, moving around this force rather than trying to, to meet it head on. It, looked, it sounded to me like uh, France is nothing very special. The, when the right parties are in, are, in, are in power, we are slowly progressing towards socialism, and when the left ones are, we are fast, pro fastly progressing. It seems like, sounds like at home. Um, what do you, now the next elections uh, in France, um, how should, what should we look forward to? Is there any hope and, uh, and um, how, where is Marie Le Pen uh, fitting in to the picture? I am sorry, but I have to confess that I have some hearing problems and especially with English. I have been told that the frequency of English is uh, larger than the French one. So maybe I ask my neighbor who, who if ever he can translate into French, because I could not catch everything of it. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, about Macron or first, uh, let me begin with a, uh, an anecdote. Recently, I. I met in a, in a meeting my, my friend Vaclav Klaus, who has been a president of the Czech Republic, and he told me, oh, uh, what do you think about your president, Micron? <laughs> <laughs> and I think he, he's right. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I have always been opposed to, to him. Um, it is, he's a very ambiguous man, very pragmatic, uh, opportunist, uh, he has no real convictions, but we must not forget that he has been a minister of finance of one of the worst uh, socialist politicians, François Hollande. And uh, it certainly means something, and I have the feeling that he has some socialist reflex. But when he was a minister of finance of Hollande, he decided to, uh, to accept competition between uh, buses, uh, and people said that it was it was purely utilitarian. But people said that he was a liberal, a liberal socialist, and he has been presented as a liberal uh, politician. And um, uh, he won the election, uh, maybe because uh, uh, the election has been manipulated. The one who had to be elected was someone on the right, who was a real liberal. Fillon, uh, and uh, I was very sad that uh, he could not succeed, but uh, there was a campaign against him which uh, has been maybe manipulated by uh, Macron, but we, we do, doesn't know. Anyhow, I remember that even before he was elected, um, I uh, wrote an article in uh, the French magazine, Le Figaro magazine, in which I explained that Macron was not a liberal. And I'm surprised that right now, people still say that he's a liberal. Just because it is true that he made some reforms which can be considered as more or less liberal, for instance, on the labor market, uh, things that ought to have been done for long. But uh, there is a, a sentence of Macron which is, uh, which is very symptomatic uh, he is used to say at the same time. So he says one thing and the contrary, and he, he believes both of them. So <laughs> he's doing some liberal reforms, but mainly not liberal reforms. And he has increased taxation, he has increased regulations, and so on and so on. And, the, and we, uh, we, we need some very deep and uh, rapid reforms, and there is no doing nothing of what would be necessary. So I am very pessimistic about, uh, about uh, this, and I'm also, also pessimistic because I don't see someone on the right we could 
be uh, elected in the next election and who could do a real uh, liberal policy. As regards uh, uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, she, it is said that she is from the extreme right just because she is against immigration. But she has a, a, an economic program which is very close to the program of the, of the extreme left. And so I'm always uh, uh, annoyed when I, I hear that she is on the extreme right. Uh, in my opinion, she is uh, on the extreme left. Or from this point of view, she, uh, she could have some success <laughs> as a public opinion <laughs> is on, on the left. And I think that uh, it's also because she is uh, pragmatic. Uh, it may be that uh, many people who uh, are confronted to immigration people are people from the uh, from the left, and so she <laughs> she gives them this uh, uh, possibility. But anyhow, there is no uh, uh, no probability at all that Marine Le Pen be elected, uh, and we may uh, we may come back to the traditional distinction between the left and the uh, and the right. Uh, it is true that some people on the right try to get closer to Marine Le Pen, maybe because the immigration problem do exist in France, but uh, uh, there cannot be a, a coordination between the right and the extreme right for the reasons I just uh, said. My name is Michael McKay. My question is primarily to Jeff, but also to Professor Salin and Professor Stone. My concern is how can we frame libertarianism so it can be heard? And I would welcome your comments about that. You know, if you'll forgive me, I, 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 I have nothing of any seriousness to say about this, <laughs> if you'll forgive me. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's very difficult to answer <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, we have hopes that uh, it could be the avenir, um, the future, but um, uh, I fear that uh, it will be difficult for libertarianism to, uh, to succeed. Um, anyhow, I, I struck by one fact. Um, whenever I uh, meet uh, a young man or woman who says that uh, he or she is liberal, I ask, uh, how did you become liberal? Because it's difficult to become liberal in France. I don't know if it's the same in, uh, in other countries in Europe, but anyhow in France. And uh, the answer in general is the following. I had by hazard, I had the opportunity to read an article or a, or a book of liberal inspiration, and uh, I discovered that it was so coherent, so uh, uh, logical, rigorous, that I was fascinated, I, I became liberal. And I have the feeling that it is true, and that uh, liberal ideas are so coherent that all people ought, ought to be liberals. Uh, and why is it they are not? It's, it's really a question. Uh, I also remember that uh, uh, Friedrich Hayek said that uh, whenever, uh, if someone uh, is not a liberal, it is only because he had not the opportunity to meet uh, liberal ideas. Uh, because he thought uh, also that uh, these ideas are, are convincing. So uh, we may wonder why these uh, liberal ideas are not so more successful. Uh, it may be because there are personal interests and people uh, in our democracies, not only in France, but in Europe, uh, the, the, the state is uh, distributing privileges and subsidies and so on, and people uh, are fighting more for that than for ideas. The first one who tries to fight against the state uh, is not uh, certain to, to be successful, so he has a cost and he pr may prefer to 
uh, the, to, to try to get some privilege. That may be a reason. And because of this vicious circle of statism, uh, it may be difficult for a real liberalism uh, to, 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 to exist. But uh, I, may, I may be wrong. I hope I am wrong. Wasn't that interesting? He mentions the intellectuals. You know, Murray Rothbard talked about this. We can't just assume that the intellectual class has no self-interest. That, that if they come across uh, something they regard as the truth, that they will, uh, you know, loudly and vociferously go out there and promote it, regardless of whether that affects their own employment or tenure or uh, uh, status within their community or whatever. So that you know, that was one of his critiques of Hayek's sort of top-down uh, intellectual approach. But I, I think at this point. The, 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 the best promoter of libertarianism will be competition. You know, some sort of breakaway movements, the kind that Prince Hans of Liechtenstein is writing about and saying, you know, government uh, re, re thought of as more of a service provider and, and subjects being thought of or citizens being thought of more as customers. I think we're gonna have to see some success, but I, I don't know, there's, there's some pretty horrific examples of why collectivism doesn't work in the 20th century. You'd think that we could sort of point to that and say, well, maybe we should go in the other direction. <laughs> Uh, but it's this lesson that seems to be that we have to relearn um, every generation. So uh, I, I do think that single issue libertarianism um, is a, a lot easier sell than the whole package. And I, and I think that we should, we should promote breakaway and secessionist and, and localist movements. And, and if somehow Trump manages to win in 2020, I think the left in the United States is going to go out of their minds and I think they are going to start saying no, you know. And I suggested this to, to someone, I think it was last night at dinner with, with Karen, we, you know, take, the, take the, the nine counties that comprise the San Francisco Bay Area. That's about eight million people, all very, very left-wing, vote for Nancy Pelosi, um, and, and let, them, let them do what they want. Let's take those nine counties. That's, that's bigger than Norway. They could have a single payer healthcare system collectively within those nine counties. They could have absolute gun control. They could have abortion on demand. They could make Berkeley and Stanford free. They could have high, steeply graduated income taxes. They could have a wealth tax. They could have the whole panoply of progressive wish lists right here, right now. And, and as someone, I'd, I'd be perfectly fine with that. I wouldn't object to that in the slightest. Now, some people in those nine counties would be harmed, but presumably it's easier for them to move uh, out of the Bay Area than it is to move and get a foreign passport. Um, so, so why not let an experiment like that happen? And I think what would immediately happen is a bunch of rich, uh, a bunch of limousine liberals in Marin County, if any of you know Marin County, would immediately leave. With, um, but nonetheless, I'd love to see it. I would absolutely love to see it. And if Trump somehow wins, I think they're gonna be, our progressive friends might be a little more um, uh, willing to, to listen to that sort of thing. Yeah, I certainly agree that competition is important. And that's why I have always been uh, much, cri much critical of harmonization in Europe. Harmonization of taxation, of laws and so on. We, we need competition and maybe the ideal would be competition between small, very small countries. Uh, let me ask something about uh, North Korea, but it's directed to the whole panel. Uh, Michael told us all of those things about uh, North Korean regime, and I see there there is a, a difference with the rest of the world, just in degree, not in kind. Like, uh, as he said, the war narrative there, they, they have their own narrative. It's like other countries in the world. The personality cult is like uh, we can see here in Turkey or even in U the US with Obama as a hero. And the state propaganda there in North Korea, we, we have it in Hollywood as well. And, but. Uh, as we don't have the free market option on the table, and it is between nationalism and globalism, and with glo globalism it came is the mass democracy and multiculturalism, and 
it came the and the North Korea I see a, a place uh, of course with a lot of huge problems but it's not uh, surrendered to the American imperialism that came with the patent laws and everything that came with the US imperialism and my question is can uh, anyone see or say something positive about North Korea uh, yeah it pays my rent which I think the people in this room would approve of. I, I, I disagree violently with comparisons that the personality cult in North Korea is in any sense comparable to how Obama is being treated in America. Uh, I mean, you can regularly attack Obama. You don't have to have his picture on your wall and your family's not gonna be executed if you uh, say the most virulent things about him. Um, uh, the propaganda out of Hollywood, which I'm certainly not a fan of, is, is not, can be immediately challenged online um, and can be pirated and, and there's all sorts of different alternatives. And besides propaganda from Hollywood, they also make comedies. So if North Korea had a few funnier movies, uh, I think life there would be a little bit better. So yeah, the, the, I, the root of what you're saying, which does have truth to it, I think, is that, and this is very much a libertarian concept, is that human beings are human beings and that there are certain, uh, um, you know, I don't know if you want to call them urges or drives or, or tendencies that we all have and that have happened throughout the years and in many ways the North Korean regime, you know, harkens back to Pharaoh and this idea of the God King. Um, but if you want me to say positive things about North Korea, I mean, uh, the scenery is lovely. Um, they are very uh, looking out for one another on a personal level, which is something that the government fosters, but which is something refugees talk about regretting when they move to Seoul. It's a very cold city in an emotional level. So there's a few couple of things you could say, but you know, the, the obvious answer is, I'm sure you know, as everyone else in, the, in this room knows, if it, it, was this, it was a question that was asked of all the communist states, if it's so great, just open the borders and see what happens. And, and I think, you know, the answers are very clear what would happen uh, in North Korea. If anyone else wants to chime in, feel free. You asked one already, that's cheating. Oh, sorry, I'm being racist. Okay, sorry. We I all look the same. I didn't see we him in my defense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Professor Stone, uh, you touched on the, uh, the, the, uh, the parallel between the European Union right now and the Habsburg Empire. Um, and you, you also mentioned that uh, there is a possibility in which uh, the nationalists of various countries would elect uh, a majority of members of European Parliament next year, uh, making Viktor Orban the, uh, the president of the European Union. Um, what will actually happen? I mean, is, will this be the hope in which the European Union will finally be reformed in a way in which, say, a typical moderate Brexiteer uh, hopes it will be reformed into? Or, or it will actually be the bureaucracy will fight back and even if all these MEPs were elected, by these nationalists uh, across the European, uh, across Europe, nothing will change. Um, yes. Uh, oh, um, I mean, I, I must say I was pretty incensed when I read that the European Parliament had, by very substantial vote, condemned Viktor Orban, and it's obviously just done out of spite. Because you'll remember, um, you know, three years ago when these refugees arrived, I mean, I saw them in Bodrum. Um, then I was on a boat and I saw them on Kos, the big island opposite. And then I saw them in the station in Hungary, trudging all that way to Germany, where it is. Uh, is that is that a bit better? Thanks. Uh, you know, I just thought this was utterly surreal. Uh, this uh, business of refugees. Now, Victor, uh, the, we all know how the Europeans respond to this kind of thing. They have a dinner, and then they think they'll make a decision in about six weeks. And trudging on, trudging on, trudging on, all these young men, not from Syria, one was actually from Haiti, of all places, um, trudging in, creating this, uh, this havoc in Germany. Uh, and Austria on the way, and uh, Viktor Orban responded, put, put up a wall. 
which has done more to solve the whole problem than the Europeans. I mean, they, they could have solved it, frankly, quite easily. Another great achievement of the European Union is the Euro. 50% unemployment in Greece. We all know that. Why not say to the Greeks, look, you have a lot of empty islands in the Aegean, particularly the southern Aegean, particularly a place called Karpatos. If you lease to us Karpatos, we'll pay your debts. And then you do the Australian solution to the, to the migrant problem. You process them, of course, as decently as you can, but you can't have this kind of thing going on in every European country. It's crazy. Now, the European Parliament, in its wisdom, condemned Viktor Orban for that and said, oh, terrible fascists and so forth, which is nonsense. And he, it, um, it teams up with... A, look, I'm sorry to go on about this, but it teams up with another problem in Hungary which nobody mentions, and it's the gypsies, Roma. Uh, it's about 20% of the population in the East. They used to get on tolerably well in Hungary, but one way or another, it's turned out rather badly. And the last thing you want in these circumstances is um, Norwegian NGOs paid for by George Soros turning up, um, causing trouble with the gypsies, saying, oh, you've got these rights and those rights. And it's, it's in response to this kind of thing that uh, Viktor Orban get his, gets his immense popularity. He's not doing too badly. I mean, I, I think uh, you, know, you have to put it in perspective that Hungary should have been the one that led from post-communism. Instead, it's rather lagging behind. And it's, this is a situation which Viktor Orban inherited. Now, what does the wretched European Parliament in its wisdom do? It condemns him. And uh, I think the, the, the upshot of this is it's quite possible that the, that group of MPs will set up a you know, straightforwardly nationalist, secessionist group in the European Parliament. And my point really is that the European Parliament should not be operating at this kind of level. If it were left as a kind of assembly of something like a Council of Europe, it would have been all right, but leave power with the national parliaments. This is where it this is where it really belongs, and have delegations from them to some kind of European thing. Then the final thing is, you know, for the European Union, bless it, to complain that Hungary is a corrupt country. I mean, for the last ten years or thereabouts, the official accountants of the European Union have refused to pass the accounts because they say there's so much money stolen. I mean, again, to cite Greece, the Greeks are wonderful, really imaginative about it. They have, um, you know, I think they've invented a Greek banana um, so that they can get the sort of subsidies that the French give to the banana producers in Martinique. Uh, and this kind of thing, everybody knows this about Europe, and for them to say, you're corrupt, hello. <laughs> Now, my, my point is uh, that uh, you know, Europe, when it was created, uh, was, um, I mean, it's a 50s construction, like the Atomium in Brussels, if you remember it. Uh, and I, you just wouldn't start from here now. Uh, you know, I mean, has Valérie Giscard d'Estaing ever got anything right except stealing diamonds? And he set up his European constitution. I mean, it takes time. Political science would tell you, keep a constitution short. You say, paragraph one, there's a country. Paragraph two, its language is the following. Um, paragraph three, yours sincerely. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, the ideal constitution is the West German one of 1948 which is quite short. It doesn't have many volumes and volumes about rights. The European Constitution, when it came up, actually has, I think it's five pages devoted to the rights of the Laps, the Sami, as we're now supposed to call them. Now, I have nothing against the Sami. The Swedes do. Um, the Swedes, uh, bless them, uh, right up to the 1970s, were sterilizing about 100,000 labs 
on the grounds that they were rather small, drank too much, and made too many babies. Now, so I'm in favour of the, 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 the dear old Sami, absolutely, but it's nothing to do with the constitution of Europe. Uh, and it's, uh, this is characteristic of what goes wrong with that organisation. I think there's going to be a backlash. There already is. I mean, we can see a fifth of the electorate in pretty well every country, obviously, coming up. who are going to be electing people who are uh, obdurate, probably rather nasty, some of them, um, uh, and, and who say, we don't want this to go on. And they'll set up a block in that European Parliament, and the results will be quite ugly. And the final joke is, uh, and the, th the, the results might be quite ugly. And the final joke, of course, is that for uh, uh, Viktor Orban himself, they'll no doubt, in their wisdom, want a president of Europe, and will no doubt come up with some empty figure like Juncker, expect him to win. Viktor Orban will be the president of Europe if this goes on. They're crazy. Have I said enough? <laughs> That's still on the question of the European Union, but to Professor Salah. Uh, if we look the, at the history of the European Union, then we come to the conclusion that the whole mess in which uh, the continent is uh, verging now is the effect of a combined action of two nations, of the French nation and of the German nation, or their politicians. Without Mitterrand and Kohl, we wouldn't have had the, uh, the Treaty of Maastricht and the transformation from the European Union to a political union. Uh, without uh, the French pressure to the Ger against the Germans, after the unification, we wouldn't have had uh, the introduction of the Euro. We wouldn't have had the mess in the, uh, in the migration policy, if not for this lady Godzilla in, in Berlin. So, I mean, what, uh, what, what, really, what, what really is interesting now, I think, is, is there any chance that the uh, increasing differences uh, between Germany and France as an effect of the multiple crisis of the European Union could bring to a glorious day where this whole socialist empire could be blown up? Uh, uh, First, uh, I would like to say that I do regret that uh, it has been considered that the uh, uh, European Union had to be, uh, uh, had to, uh, to follow what was decided by uh, France and Germany, um, because uh, I think that uh, French governments uh, mainly tried to export to European Union uh, the bad policies that they were doing, uh, and uh, and happily, uh, Germany more or less agreed with that. But I must say that, in my opinion, Germany is not that far from uh, what uh, exists in uh, in France, and I do regret, and I should say also I don't understand why. Uh, the other countries in Europe did accept this situation, did accept this uh, leadership of, of Germany uh, and France. And in speci especially, I, uh, I would like that uh, uh, Central and uh, Eastern countries of Europe be more efficient in uh, uh, fighting against this uh, uh, leadership of German-French leadership. And frankly, I don't really understand why it, it is so. Uh, um, ideally, uh, I, I am in favor of a European Union, but uh, not the one we have, but what I call a Europe of freedom. Uh, it is a Europe of competition, of, uh, of freedom without harmonization. And I think the best integration uh, is made by competition because it is the way people can coordinate one to the other. So I don't want to, uh, to make a guess on the future because it is very difficult to, to guess what politicians will do. 
uh, will there be a discrepancy between the, uh, the targets of Germany and France? I'm not certain of that, I'm not certain. And uh, because I think that the politicians, both in Germany and France, are proud to give the feeling that they are um, uh, the, the leaders of the, of the European Union. Uh, what would be necessary would be that a change in the public opinion in all European countries uh, in favor of this uh, Europe of uh, liberties. Um, I am not in favor of, uh, uh, of, a, uh, of a explosion of, uh, of Europe. I, I am once more in favor of the uh, European Union uh, because I'm in favor of uh, free trade, free contracts, and so on. Uh, and, but uh, I fear that it will be difficult to, to get this sort of, uh, of Europe. So it's difficult to, uh, to guess. Um, one specific point, uh, when there was what was called the Greek crisis, um, uh, it was uh, interpreted as a European crisis, and it was said that European solidarity meant that uh, other countries had to, to help uh, the, 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 the Greek government. Um, in, uh, and people also said that the solution for, uh, for Greece would be to go out of the European Union. And so there are several um, pressures in favor of the of this sort of policy in, in, in several countries. In fact, the Greek problem was not a European problem. It was a, a national problem with a, a, a bad uh, uh, public policy. Um, and there was no reason for uh, other uh, countries to, to help. Um, and the solution for Greece was certainly not to go out, because I think that implicitly people who were in favor of uh, uh, the, the fact that uh, Greece uh, goes out of uh, European Union, we're thinking that it could devalue. But I consider that devalue is not a solution. It is a bad solution and uh, it cannot solve the problems such, uh, that, uh, such as the problem of uh, excessive public expenditures. So once more, I don't want to, to, to make guess about the future of Europe. I can only uh, have some wishes, and the wishes is a, a free Europe. My question is to Jeff. Um, considering the conquest second law, how should we handle the Zeitgeisters, and specifically those who are actually within our own institutions? Well, I think we have to handle them by um by boldly opposing them. We have to uh, never shrink from the, the vision we have or from the truth as we understand it and, uh, and be bold. I think uh, compromise has been a one-way street. If you look at the 20th century, <laughs> it seems to only go in one direction. So I, I don't think that's working. And I think uh, Boldness is easier on the smallest possible level. So hopefully that's where it's, it's going to happen. And maybe some of it will happen simply because large governments can, can no longer do what they purport to do. They can't uh, pay entitlements. They can't keep the roads. They can't uh, uh, pr prevent crime. They can't prevent, uh, or they can't uh, prevent unemployment. So, so maybe it's going to take some sort of unpleasantness to to uh, force people into more local solutions. But I, I think, you know, my particular focus today was on the zeitgeist libertarians. And in that sense, I think we should, we should uh, view them much like we view progressives or, uh, or neoconservatives or old conservatives, which is that we're friendly. We are, uh, it, it, but, and we're willing to um, join them on single issue bases, but we're not willing to cede um, the, the terms of the debate to them. And, and libertarianism is not about some uh, Jack Kemp tax enterprise zone or something like that. Um, it, it's about something much more fundamental. So to me, that's not only better, but it's a lot more fun 
and and um, and what you know why why be halfway? Yeah, well, Stefan, I'm looking, for, trying to look for some uh, op optimism here. <laughs> so, um, I'm referring not to your talk, but uh, to uh, to a topic in your um, in one of your podcasts. What about the chances for uh, in, for some more freedom via technological? Uh, solutions, um, uh, Bitcoin or crypto uh, contracts or, I don't know, self-driving cars, stuff like that. It's actually to the whole panel, if you have an idea. Optimistic. Um, well, yeah, I, I try not to opine too much on Bitcoin because there's people who are big experts on this. Um, I do see hope in, in that as a challenge to state money. Uh, the example of Uber is a really good one, I believe. Yeah, I, and what you're talking about, I, I've argued before that uh, I, I'm skeptical of the libertarian uh, strategy of winning by handing out pamphlets to your uncle at Thanksgiving dinners. And, you know, I, it's just some people, are, it's not going to work that way. But we do have to have some larger consensus. And how does that happen? I think it can only happen somehow naturally or gradually. Uh, my impression is that most of the people in the world now, uh, or more, significantly more, or aware of, in general, the dangers of centralized planning because of the fall of the Soviet Union and communism. So that was a teaching moment. We didn't have to go to school to learn that. We saw it happen. Okay, so we learned our lesson that way. So uh, my hope is that as we get richer, and we are getting richer, I believe, uh, as technology improves, uh, and as freedom maybe becomes more possible because of technology, right? I mean. Not to get too science fiction-y, but in the future you can imagine people having little nano swarm robot armies protecting the th who, who knows? I don't know. So I just hope that over time people are richer and they see the benefits of living in, a, in liberalism, right, in a freer society. And so it becomes a sort of gradual teaching moment, sort of like the fall of the Soviet Union did. So I can only hope that the, the sort of stallion, the horse, the steed of the market that's underneath the little biting dogs of the state trying to slow it down. I hope that it can outrun them finally. I think it's a race, and I hope the state doesn't destroy humanity, right? But humanity seems to keep progressing because knowledge does keep in, uh, increasing, right? We keep building our technical knowledge base. Technology seems to keep improving, so our wealth will keep improving. Our ability to communicate will keep improving. So that's my sort of optimistic view of things. Uh, but it does mean that we can't really do it. We just have to ride the wave. Uh, we, can, we can keep the remnant alive. We can keep championing ideas. We can keep the understanding alive. But I don't, I don't see that if we have a much higher degree of liberty in 30 years, 50 years, that it's because libertarians were, were activists advocating for it or trying to start the Libertarian Party. I think it will be because of a natural, natural causes. It, it has to take root for natural reasons. I have a question to Michael and maybe others too um, concerning possible uh, economical transformation of North Korea, especially regards uh, Resen, a special economic zone uh, earlier called Raijin Son Bong. Um, do you consider it a um, purely experimental project to get a taste of uh, Western economy or more a potential basis to transform North Korea's economy? Well, I, I mean, what he's asking about is, so there's a zone in North Korea, uh, it's near the city of Kaesong, it's basically built by the South Koreans uh, to get to work there is highly coveted, although I think the tax rate is something like 95%, but even with that 95% tax rate, the people who work there are doing very well for themselves. It's extremely regulated because you don't want the North Koreans, or they don't rather they want, want the North Koreans to have access to so much South Korean information. They, they open these zones down, they shut them down um, every so often because they get too successful. Another example some of you might have heard of is with the Vice magazine, how these logging camps in Russia, which families go and, and, or not families, like men go and work there for pennies, but they send all their money back to North Korea and they still do well, well by North Korean standards even though they don't uh, see their families for a very long time. So the, the thing with what's happening with North Korea now is you have these black markets in these different towns and they are effectively acting as proof of concept of the free market or quasi free market and how it works and what's it's what's interesting for north korea is that this is uh, inverting the gender hierarchy these are often run by women 
uh, and they'll have rice or whatever for sale and you'll have the cops the cops get a bribe which basically works like a tax and the, the goods get to the consumer. Everyone knows where to get them, although it's not officially stated. Uh, and this black market system is you know, throughout the entire country, and it's a very effective mechanism to demonstrate capitalism. Now, what I'm fine with, and I'm sure most people in this room are fine with, and, and kind of touches on what Jeff said earlier, and what Kinsella said earlier, is uh, I don't have to have someone say I'm a liberal or I'm a libertarian, but if they intuitively are for free markets and they don't have a philosophy behind it and they're feeding their families and they're, you know, have a measure of liberty in their lives, that to me is someone who is converted enough that they don't, you know, it, what I mean, it, and that's a very real accomplishment and that's a very real goal. The goal for all of us, I'm sure, who are for liberty is to make sure people are secure in their person, make sure people have access to food, access to sell their labor, uh, and access to you know human rights, including proper rights on a very fundamental level. So uh, the thing with the, those economic zones, yeah, these are wonderful because First of all, if the argument from North Korea is that we're so wealthy, well, as I was saying earlier, somebody, South Korea is so wealthy that they're exporting factories. I mean, the idea of a communist country, you know, you want to build as many factories in your country. Uh, now that they're exporting factories and you could see how the machines are, you could see they have electricity. North Korea does not have electricity for the most part. So anytime you have a, uh, uh, there's a big asymmetry, I'll leave with this point, between lies and the truth. If someone tells you, 10 lies and 10 truths, this is not an honest person. But if someone tells you, you know, 50 truths and 10 lies, that's still not an honest person. So when you have a government that's told you information from the time you're born until you're an adult, as soon as you see two or three things, very quickly intellectually this edifice falls. And once you lose the souls of the North Korean and their belief in the state and its efficacy and the, the leadership, it's almost impossible to regain it. And this cynicism, which helped so much to bring down the Soviet Union and, and Eastern Europe, is really, in my view, what is currently bringing down the North Korean regime.